Skiing. I don't know. I'm just going to give it a try. It's like a super soaker. <laughs> <laughs> it's that wet snow, so you just get drenched, but it feels so good because it was 85 degrees. That day, so. All right, <clears throat> we are good to go, I believe. We'll, let's get this started. So, uh, I'll give you a, I'll give you a quick introduction for you. We've already been chatting for a while, yeah. but uh, we are very excited about this program. We have to go for the lottery, so thank you all uh, for attending in person. This is a very strange experience <laughs> with all of us uh, faced apart, masks on. <laughs> Uh, indoors, but we're also uh, live on Facebook and we're recording now. So um, for everyone tuning in digitally, welcome and uh, get excited because here we have Granite State Bigfoot. Um, we're very excited to have Alexander here uh, presenting with us, cryptozoologist and filmmaker. So I'm going to have a tease of some of his filmmaking later. He's done a lot in, um, in other uh, interests in cryptozoology. Uh, so check out that information as well. But today we're interested in New Hampshire Let's hear about uh, that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys all for coming. Again, my name is Alexander Pedicon. Just before I start out, I just want to say that this is dedicated to my friend Michael Mitchell, who actually was from Tilton, so very close to here. He had a he passed away unfortunately in 2019, but I collaborated with him on a comic book in 2018 called Grant State Bigfoot. You guys can check that out afterwards. Uh, he was he was very interested in, in this kind of stuff. He did comics about a lot of different uh, New Hampshire related topics. The Exeter UFO incident. Uh, he did one about the, the witch there, witch story, about uh, Goody Cole and that sort of stuff. And um, fortunately he passed away very untimely. Uh, so this is dedicated to him. It was you know, a pleasure to work with him. He kind of sparked a lot of the ideas and he just sort of messaged me one day, said, are the settings in New Hampshire? I said, oh boy, send him a list. And that's how it started. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I'm a filmmaker, I'm into photography, multimedia, hiking, travel adventures, as we have been discussing so far, uh, searching for the unknown. That's something I always like to couple with a love for the outdoors is you know, wherever you go, oh, there was this sighting of a Bigfoot here, or there's a lake monster here, or there's UFO history here. It's like wherever you go around the world, you can find different things that kind of go with your interest. And I think it goes hand in hand. So just a quick, brief uh, description of some of the projects I've done. 2016 was my first sort of documentary about cryptozoology, uh, Mystery at Loch Ness. Uh, I went on a trip there, it was like a lifelong uh, dream to go to Loch Ness and just kind of poked around with my camera. It was a short film I put out. The Sasquatch Out of the Shadows uh, was originally supposed to be a feature documentary about Bigfoot, but it kind of morphed into something else. And I started a YouTube channel, which I still have now, and I do weekly live streams with different Bigfoot researchers and investigators. I've had Cliff Berrickman on from Finding Bigfoot and lots of other folks. We have some pretty exciting uh, programs. It's just, it's a sort of a casual conversation, but on the channel, there are also documentaries about Bigfoot. And one of the ones I'm going to be showing today, Shy Man of the White Mountains, is about New Hampshire, but there's some other states. There's uh, Massachusetts, uh, Connecticut, out west, some of the states, Ohio, other places where Bigfoot is kind of a big topic. This is just a little bit about this is the comic book itself. So of course, you have the Bigfoot staring at the iconic old man of the mountains. Wouldn't, wouldn't be New Hampshire without it. So that's uh, just a little bit about that. 2018, I did a mini series about Champ of Lake Champlain, uh, America's Loch Ness, so called. Uh, it was a lot of fun to really explore that area. Lake Champlain has become one of my favorite places because it's just you know, a mix of mountains and this huge, almost uh, like a mini sea kind of environment and this enduring mystery of this lake monster. I uh, just released in 2020, Lions of the East, which is about mountain lions and mystery big cats in New England. I'm sure you folks have heard probably of sightings, people claiming they've seen one or uh, stories of that nature where folks are saying that there are mountain lions and they're not supposed to be here. The authorities are saying they're not here, but sightings persist of not only the sort of regular tawny colored big cats, but mountain lions as well, or uh, black panther looking cats as well. This is just a fun little map I put together a few years ago, New England cryptids, just to give you an idea of some of the crazy stuff that we have in this area. You have 
everything from the Block Nest Monster in Block Island in Rhode Island to the Dairy Ferry in 1956 in Hampshire. Videos. Probably never heard of that. It's a very obscure, kind of strange story. Lots of stories like that. Some are more on the folkloric side, some are more perhaps misplaced animals, mountain lions, that sort of stuff. On that note, just a brief uh, description of cryptozoology. So it's the study of hidden or undiscovered animals. So you have various cryptids, that would be the animal itself, Bigfoot, of course, what we're here to talk about. But you have things like Loch Ness Monster, like Champlain, the Tasmanian tiger, a previously thought to be extinct marsupial animal that lives in parts of Australia and Tasmania that some believe is still alive despite it allegedly going extinct over 100 or so years ago. So some former cryptids would be things like the Okapi, which you can't even really describe. I mean, it's like a zebra mixed with a giraffe sort of thing. I don't know what exactly you would describe it, but that's the stories that were coming out of these areas in Africa where it lives, just like the gorilla. Stories of a hairy man-like creature told by the natives. Where does that sound familiar? The giant squid, of course, we know that there are massive uh, squid out there, and the coelacanth, sort of the poster child, which is it's a prehistoric fish thought to be extinct for millions upon millions of years, and live specimens were uh, have been documented, and the first one in the 1930s was actually brought up accidentally off the coast of South Africa in a fishing net. So this goes to show just because it disappears off the fossil record doesn't mean it might not disappear entirely. There's a little bit of mythology and folklore, of course. You have all these old stories, whether or not they're based on reality, that's what we try to kind of determine or figure out. You have stuff like the Piazza Bird. This is a story from the Midwest. Uh, native tribes tell of this strange winged creature. Uh, sea monsters, of course, all the old maps back in the day had depictions of these horrible looking creatures. Oftentimes they were narwhals or whales or strange creatures they weren't familiar with that we now know. The Beast of Gévaudan, which is one of the original werewolf stories from uh, France. Of course, the dragon is one of the most iconic ones in the Woodwolves, which is the hairy, middle-aged sort of hairy man in your uh, depiction. We'll talk a little bit about that. But just a bit about my approach, boots on the ground in terms of the documentary aspect. So you're visiting the area, location, you're talking to people who live in the area, you're not just going to waltz in. I was mentioning I was just in Arizona. I'm not just going to waltz in and assume I know everything about the area. We want to talk to people who specialize in wildlife in that area, documenting the local cryptid. When you interview them, you don't want to feed them a story. You want to let them tell their story instead of asking a leading question. Um, and even people who are skeptical say, you know, what is something that might be confused for something like a Bigfoot in this area? Could you tell me? That sort of thing. So documentaries are a great way to preserve individual experiences, but also the folklore regional story. So every area has their different story with Bigfoot. They are different names. You know, sometimes they've been around since before the term Bigfoot even came about. And the ultimate goal is to create informative and entertaining documentaries that take these subjects seriously. We've been inundated with way too much reality TV stuff in the past few years that just doesn't take it seriously. It makes a mockery of the subject. It's either openly fake or really doesn't take it seriously. And I think a lot of people grew up on in search of and some of those shows that you know, they, they and try to portray the subject accurate in the sense of talking to people who are involved in New England focus, of course. Just a little bit about the origins of Bigfoot. So you have tons of different references to hairy giants and giant hairy man-like creatures across the world in different cultures in the sort of recesses of the wilderness or just off the edge of civilization. You have these beasts living there, like this depiction of a medieval knight fighting some sort of a hairy, large, hairy man-like creature with uh, holding a stick. So in European culture, you have, as I mentioned, the wood woes. And that's not necessarily, doesn't mean it's Bigfoot, but it's just an interesting depiction that there's always that sort of man-like creature. Even if that this doesn't exist, we always tend to have this sort of alter ego. Maybe it's a Jekyll and Hyde thing. You know, we are civilized. We live in these societies that we built, but you have maybe these hairy man-like creatures that have shunned our ways, and that's we always have that in the back of our minds, whether we like it or not. In uh, parts of the Caucasus and Russia and, and Eastern Europe, you have stories of the Almas and the Almasti supposedly even interacting with locals in some of those areas, and it's sometimes seen with tools or even wearing clothing, almost Neanderthal like. And these are some of the areas like the Caucasus where they discovered various human uh, hybrid species, the Denisovans. Uh, Neanderthals, a lot of these species that some people say, well, maybe there's still existing groups of these uh, uh, home, you know, they're, they're part of the homo genus, maybe they're still out there in these parts of Siberia that nobody really 
sightings too. And it's interesting that those sightings kind of differ from a lot of the North American sightings. In Asia, of course, you have the Yeti, the abominable snowman. Everyone has heard of that. Uh, rock apes in Vietnam. There's actually some very interesting stories that come out of a lot of the GIs there during the Vietnam War experiencing you know, man-sized ape-like creatures that were throwing rocks at them in the jungles in Vietnam. Very interesting stories in Japan. You have the Hibagon. And these are just some depictions from a few hundred years ago in some of these cultures. Obviously, this person here is not having a great time being disemboweled by a male and female Yeti, as we can see. And then this is uh, you know, from some sort of manuscripts. So it's just interesting to see these depictions you know, hundreds of years ago. Australia, you have the Yowie. Same kind of thing is described in a lot of these areas. Yowie, wild man. Obviously, there's a lot of very interesting wildlife in Australia. It's a continent that was divergent from the rest of the world. So they have things like the platypus. I mean, that's one of the weirdest animals out there, right? Kangaroos, wallabies, the thylacine, as I mentioned, very, very divergent kind of species there. But they, again, have these stories of hairy, wild, uh, Bigfoot-like creatures. I think North America has some of the most interesting cultural depictions of this sort of stuff, and that comes from the, the native peoples, the, the First Nation peoples. So everyone's heard of the term Sasquatch. You guys have Sasquatch on your shirt there. Now that's actually an anglicized term from a coastal British Columbian uh, tribe where uh, it was sort of a description of a hairy person in the woods, Sasquatch, and they kind of made it sense by calling it Sasquatch for anglicized folks. And um, lots of different depictions across the across the country you have. The Oma, the stone giants, this depiction here is from, I believe, upstate New York, the, the Iroquois nation, and some of their depictions of these things. And this is a coastal uh, tribe in, in British Columbia there as well with their traditional costume. And this picture was taken over 100 years ago. And it's just kind of interesting that it looks very similar to maybe a gorilla costume or a big foot costume you might see in the 21st century. Uh, and that's you know, just part of their culture. This is some more, this is from California, a depiction of these Bigfoot-like creatures, or at least what these groups were you know, calling some sort of a big brother. Or it, it depends from tribe to tribe. There were stories that they were cannibal giants that would steal your, your women and, and your children. Other times, it was just a different tribe that lived in the woods. They had a different way of living. These are just some more maps. These are really interesting. These are all from British Columbia. And I mean, there's been anthropologists that have looked at this and said, I mean, it's very intriguing that you see almost ape facial features. I mean, how would a tribe isolated in the mountains of British Columbia know what a chimp does when it's agitated? Chimps will bare their teeth when they want to be intimidating or the hooting or the hollering. And these are all just part of their uh, traditional uh, costumes and attires for various ceremonies. So obviously in North America, you have a presence of Europeans for uh, almost 400 plus years now. And with that came stories. So one of the first actually sort of Bigfoot stories, if we want to call it that, was of a strange animal seen in, 18, in 1765 in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, so not terribly far from us here. And it was described as uh, had the height of a large bear and was white with a bushy head, dark, leathery face. And uh, apparently the, uh, some folks had run across it sleeping in the woods. You have stories of Daniel Boone killing a 10-foot hairy giant called a Yahoo in Kentucky. President Teddy Roosevelt, he was a, a very big outdoorsman, uh, nature guy, hunter, he was hunting all sorts of big game out there. He described stories of hearing strange howls and a story told to him by hunting guides of uh, people that were killed by these hairy man-like creatures out there. Of course, the famous Ape Canyon attack in Washington State near Mount St. Helens, where a group of miners claimed that they were attacked by a group of these hairy creatures all night, had rocks pelted, and they tried to break in and knock their cabin down. And then you have lum uh, lumberjack Albert Austin, who claimed to have been actually captured in a sleeping bag and held captive by a group of four Bigfoot-like creatures in 1924. People, you know, some people have cast doubt on that, uh, but it's still an interesting story, the fact that this man kind of came forward with the story. It's just an interesting idea. These are just some uh, newspaper clippings. So you have ape men eight feet tall with hairy bodies like bears seen in Rocky Mountains. Wild man startles people in Kentucky. Now, it's important to remember at this time period, the news media left a lot to be desired. Maybe that can be said about today, too. But at this time, you had what was called yellow journalism, which was basically flat out just making stuff up to sell newspapers. The more interesting the story, the more copies are going to fly off the shelf. So that's something to take into account. But I mean, that's not to discount all these stories. There are so many of these tales of 
big gorilla attacks Gettysburg visit. It's interesting how before there was common knowledge of gorilla, a lot of these sorts of things were reported as wild man or a hairy man. Once gorillas entered the lexicon and people were aware of what a gorilla was, they started describing it as gorillas out there. Oh, we saw an eight foot gorilla out in the woods. Kind of interesting, why would they just make that sort of detail up? This is one about the Connecticut Winstead wild man. This was in the North Adams uh, transcript and strange marauder now known to be a full grown gorilla has been prowling around for three years. I mean, that's sort of interesting, something to be happening in 1895, right? And the origins of the modern concept of Bigfoot is, as I mentioned, Sasquatch. So you had, that was an anglicized word, and this is a Canadian stamp, and then this is a souvenir actually. <laughs> Where it's called a Sasquatch, and they sort of, it almost looks tribal in a way. That's the way it was kind of described before, is that gorilla-like appearance in a lot of the later times with uh, the Patterson Giblin film, which we'll get into. Abominable Snowman, of course, everyone, as I mentioned, has heard that story in the expeditions after the Second World War that went up to the Himalayas and claimed to have found footprints and uh, bones and these kinds of pieces of evidence that hasn't really amounted to much, but there's been a lot of very interesting stories coming from that part of the world for centuries. Now the term Bigfoot itself was coined in the 1950s uh, in Northern California, in near a place called Bluff Creek, up in the mountains there, way in Northern California. Uh, logging crews were finding strange footprints and claiming that their equipment was being messed with, and they would find these footprints, and a journalist, uh, I can't exactly remember which one particularly, but the way it worked with the AP Newswire was once the story got out, oh, they just called it Bigfoot, kind of made sense. I mean, the footprints were big, and that's how the name stuck. So that's what you have sort of the term Bigfoot. Some people think it's not as serious, doesn't sound very scientific, but most people now, they consider it Bigfoot Sasquatch. They're pretty interchangeable. You have, of course, the famous Patterson Gimlin footage from 1967 shot there in that same area where the term Bigfoot originated. And it's interesting because it's probably the most scrutinized piece of video ever after the Zapruder film, which shows the assassination of JFK. It's been analyzed time and time again, and no one's been able to come to a conclusion one way or the other. So it's an interesting, I don't think it proves anything, unfortunately. It's just an interesting, perhaps, uh, video, but there's no way to authenticate it now, especially so many years later. But that's what most people know. When you see depictions of Bigfoot, you know, with the hands moving sideways, it's from Patty, so-called, with the Patterson Gimlin foot. Probably recognize a few of these guys. The pop culture icon, Bigfoot is really interesting because it's uh, no one that owns the copyright. It's not like Mickey Mouse where you got to pay loyalties or royalties to Disney. Big, anyone can use Bigfoot from video games to Jack and Steve Jerky. Everyone knows about Bumble from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Uh, you know, younger folks may know in the video games there's often Bigfoot will be an Easter egg and it's kind of hidden off in the missions. Harry and Henderson's sports teams will use it as an icon. So it's a Everyone knows about Bigfoot. Really quickly, we'll talk about just some theories. Uh, these are not my theories, they're just the, the prevailing theories, let's say, about what something like a Bigfoot could be if it were real. Gigantopithecus is one of them that is believed to be the largest ape to exist in history thousands of years ago in parts of China. And the only reason it was actually discovered was in Chinese apothecary shops, which is sort of the, the medicine where they would grind up bones they considered to be dragon bones. In the 1930s and 40s, Anthropologists and paleontologists were discovering all these bones of deceased species in these shops in, in parts of China. And they found these large molars that were way bigger than human teeth, and that turned out to be the Gigantopithecus. So the only fossil evidence we have for it really existing are uh, a few thousand teeth and parts of uh, the jawbone and, and the skull. That's really it. There's nothing else. So a lot of it is speculation what it might have looked like. But some people theorize, hey, maybe this thing is still alive, and that's what explains the Yeti. And, the Yaren in China, and maybe this thing came across the land bridge to North America, and that's how it settled this area. There's a lot of theories. And along those lines, relic hominids, so other groupings that were part of the sort of human evolution tree or bush, as they call it now, Paranthropus Neanderthal, as I mentioned, some sightings in parts of Russia and, and um, Siberia really describe more of a Neanderthal like thing, even using tools or clothing. Whereas in North America, it's strictly sort of a hairy creature. Some people think there's a paranormal connection. Maybe there's a UFO or interdimensional. It gets kind of wilder the, the, the deeper you go into it. But uh, 
some people claim, you know, there's UFOs and Bigfoot sightings going on at the same time. Um, in my experience, the majority of the people I've uh, interviewed, eyewitnesses and researchers, maybe you know, 80, 90 percent, it's the way that they see a creature, it's in a way that would, you see a moose, it's running away from you, or you'd see a deer. It's, it's inhibiting traits that are, that are of a biological animal. Some people say, oh, well, we've seen it, and it disappears right in front of us, but that's a minority of reports. Of course, hoaxes, you can't really trust anything on the internet these days, like this photo here. Yeah, that's obviously a bear, and somebody made it look like something else. You have the famous hoax from 2008 in Georgia, where they claimed to have killed a Bigfoot, and that was covered, it was a big press conference. I think that was the last time the media really took a claim like this seriously there was a lot of money on the line and it was all these con artists and hoaxers that pulled it off and then of course footprint fakes it's possible to do this kind of stuff but even if a small percentage of the sightings are not explained by hoaxes or or misidentifications then there's still something to work on there's something to work with people had experiences and as i said misidentifications maybe people seeing a bear standing in a weird way it's happened to me too when you're out in the woods and you see a stump in a certain light like man that looks like it. something is sitting here and when you go up to it, it's just uh, just a tree or a stump. And it's important to make that distinction. You go up and you're following up. You're not just going off of what you initially saw because your eyes can see. Uh, humans are unfortunately terrible eyewitnesses. So the more credibility you have in terms of finding out exactly what it was or being able to verify that, the more credible the sighting. Just a distribution of sightings across North America here. So you have, I want you to pay attention to the clusters here. You have. Uh, this gentleman said he lived in Washington State, so you can see, you can't even see Washington State. It's just straight sightings all, all up and down the Pacific Northwest, and then you have these clusters uh, through into the South and in the Midwest, and uh, Ohio is a big one, Florida, of course, up into the Northeast. There are definitely more sightings for me in New Hampshire. This is an old now, uh, but it's the one that I think just best illustrates kind of the clusters. Now, this is average precipitation and rainfall every year. So you see the entire eastern half of the country. This is you know, green areas where you have the Appalachian Mountains that go from north to south. The swamps down south, you can see they obviously the bayous in Florida, so it's a tropical environment. They get a lot of rain down there. And then this is the green area where we have a lot of these temperate forests. You have a lot of snowfall and rainfall every year. Same thing with Washington. These are the areas that get the most rain in North America. The temperate rainforest, the Olympic Peninsula, where, where this guy lived. Beautiful area all up and down here, and then you have the Rocky Mountains. And then you've got the desert, you've got the plains, there's a lot of uh, a lot of empty territory there, not as many forests and that sort of stuff. And this is the forestation. So Maine is actually number one in the country for around 89 percent forested. And New Hampshire is trailing close behind at 84. I mean, you guys know we live around here. We've got woods everywhere, plenty of habitat for all sorts of things to live. Now, if you put all these three maps kind of together, it's interesting. You see the sightings seem to tend to cluster eastern part of the country, really where that rainfall is, and in the Pacific Northwest as well, and the Rocky Mountains. You're not getting as many in South Dakota and Iowa and some of these areas that really are more of the, the corn areas where you fly agriculture, a lot of plains, you know, the Great Plains, that sort of area. Now that's interesting. If Bigfoot's all in our heads, why aren't people in Brooklyn having sightings or uh, all over the place. It kind of tends to go in these clusters, which I think is interesting. Now, uh, gorillas and other apes need a certain amount of precipitation to exist, to live, because they live in these forests, in these rainforests. Now, the most conducive environment for an ape might be the Pacific Northwest. That's Maybe that's why there's so many sightings up there. Something to think about. These are just some regional names. There's so many. You got the booger, that's what they call it in parts of Alabama in the south. Old yellow top. Uh, Durham Gorilla in Maine, Big Muddy, Woods Devils in New Hampshire, Wood Apes, Skunk Ape in Florida, you name it, there's lots of local variations. Now this is pretty cool. This is a wood cutout up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, right on the U.S. Canadian border practically, and it's somebody did a really cool job of Bigfoot hanging out with all his forest friends. Now, I've seen this thing since, and when there's not three feet of snow, there's a snapping turtle, and there's a couple other things you can see, but just kind of goes to show again as I talk about Bigfoot and the, and the cultural influence of it, it's really kind of in the back of people's minds. You're in a wooded area, oh, well, maybe there's Bigfoot. Whether you're into it or not, it's always something that people can use as a branding tool or even just kind of to bring people into an area and talk about it. So this is a sighting map of from the BFRO, which is the Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, one of the largest national groups. They have lots of members in different states and how they usually work is 
uh, once somebody becomes a member, uh, they are an investigator for that area. So if people report a sighting to the BFRO for Illinois, it'll be sent to an investigator that lives in Illinois. Same thing with New Hampshire. I happen to know um, two of the investigators that are from New Hampshire. I believe there's only two right now. Um, but from data from Crystal Panic, who's, the, who's one of the researchers, she says that this is kind of what the data looks like in terms of the counties. And you can see Coas County, you think maybe what happened most, it's all up in the woods. That's actually where the least people are. You need people to have sightings. Mm -hmm. So how it works with the BFRO is you have, well, in general, you have class A sightings, which you can submit. Class A sighting would be, you absolutely saw something. You know exactly what else. If I saw a moose, that would be a class A moose sighting. If I heard a moose, that would be class B. So that's how it works with the Bigfoot sightings as well. You have a class A, that means you were able to visually confirm what it was, you knew what it was. Class B would be things like wood knocks or hearing howls and, and those sorts of things. Class A and B, sometimes you have those rare encounters where there's both, which is really interesting. Um, but you have all these different counties with uh, lots of sightings, so you'd be surprised some of the ones in the southern part, Rockingham, and Hillsboro, that's my county, lots of, uh, lots of sightings in that area. Now this is, um, you know, collected over the years, of course, there's still a lot of backlogged cases that have to be investigated because once a report gets put in, the researcher then has to reach out to the person if they left contact information, a lot of the times they'll be pranks or people saying, oh, I want to be on TV, get me on Finding Bigfoot. But sometimes if they're credible, you know, they'll talk to the person, do a follow-up call. And if that person is, is willing to let them come out to their property and kind of check it out and further interview them, and then based on the credibility of the witness and, and that investigation, that will then be put onto the public database that you can actually go on their website and check it out. And a lot of research groups operate that way. You're not just going to say, what well, just some random guy on the internet, oh, I saw it here. Oh, that's definitely confirmed. We're going to put that on the website. There's actually like a vetting process, which I think is pretty interesting. So 239 total reports for New Hampshire. I think it's way more. Uh, there's plenty that aren't on the databases. There's plenty that you hear face-to-face uh, -face or a friend. You know, oh, my uncle had this encounter, my grandfather. I've heard so many stories just from even doing these kind of talks where people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, I had this experience or uh, a very interesting one I heard. Uh, and the last time I did a talk like this, somebody came and told me their uh, grandfather, I believe, was a prison camp guard up in Stark, uh, New Hampshire, which is up in Cross County. During World War II, they had German POWs cutting trees and doing logging, a lot of logging up there, and they apparently refused to go out the woods because they were seeing gorillas. And we're talking, you know, people from Germany who have no connection to Bigfoot or any of these kinds of stories. Really interesting reports like that. So has anybody here, by any chance, had any encounters or? Know anyone who has had any encounters? We all have an interest though. That, that's what matters. That's what got me into it. Some people get into it because they have had an experience. I know plenty of people like that. And then it becomes almost their life goal to try and prove to themselves maybe what they saw again because they probably dealt with maybe years of ridicule or all sorts of things. It's still taboo to talk about this in a lot of ways. I do have something that lives up near my barn. My barn is literally in the middle of the woods. It's about 600 feet from my house. And I'm actually afraid to put a camera up there because if I see something, I'm never going back up there. <laughs> but sometimes my horses are really agitated. Okay, yeah. And so, so it's odd. Interesting. I, I will have to talk to you about that. Afterwards. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, in Hampshire, as we talked about, lots of forests, mountains. We have so many water sources. We have other animals that live here and thrive. Huge animals. And people say, how would something as large as a Bigfoot is reported to be survive? Well, moose, I mean, those things are the largest animal pretty much in North America. And we have a whole lot of moose. We talked about Moose Alley, probably the biggest concentration of them in one area. But just a quote from Crystal Panic, um, who, as I mentioned, is the New Hampshire VFR investigator. I'm currently working on about 30 cases. I need to finish closing a bunch. I do have a backlog that I'm currently working on as well. A large number of reports that come in are obvious hoaxes, jokes, or assumed hoaxes. And those are closed out right away. So that's, again, as I said, they, they don't just put every report up. This was actually an interesting hair sample that she collected in 2016 on an investigation of property where horses were involved as well, the agitation. And I'm not sure if they got this tested or not, but uh, the DNA testing is not a cheap thing to do. It's actually pretty expensive and pretty time consuming. So people always say, oh, if you get a sample, why don't you just test it right away? Well, it's not that easy. And that's why a lot of times when we do these big DNA studies or, or investigations, they'll take samples in from different people because that's an opportunity to put in your sample without having to pay hundreds and 
maybe even thousands of dollars for using a laboratory's uh, sophisticated techniques at the time. So wood devils, that's a term I've been kind of investigating for a while. I've heard that story. Uh, you've seen it floating around online in different forums. People say, oh, well, the wood devils up in Coas County, they would hide behind trees and wait for people and kind of scare them, or they would they could stand so still that you would walk almost right up to them before it took off running, tall, gray, and hairy. I used to think maybe it was just a, a story that somebody put out on the internet. So I tried to track down the story from that area, and I was told that it was from the days of logging, the late 1800s, that there was these stories being told, lots of tall tales, and this was one of them. But I did, and I was told by other folks as well that, for example, I had a guy messaging me one time saying, hey, I mean, I, I have family camp up in Pittsburgh, and my grandfather, who lived up there his whole life, he used to scare us with stories of, don't go in the woods or the wood devils will get you just to keep the kids in the camp, sort of mm -hmm. a, a boogeyman sort of story. This is a, a picture of looking in the Coas County. This is from Mount Cabot. This was when I was doing Mount Cabot for my 48, and we stayed up at the cabin, a friend of mine and I, and he wasn't a big hiker. I kind of dragged him along because I had no one else to really go that weekend, but he was willing, and it's 40, 50 degrees down in the valley. We'd get up on the mountain. we hit, we get the first snow of the season up on top of us. All the high peaks got all the, <laughs> All the snow then so we sat up in this rickety old cabin on the top of mount cabot but this was one of the views we were coming down so that that's colas county this is one of the books i was pointed to history of colas county from 1888 which allegedly first mentions the story of the wood devil i found an online version and i tried to search for that term it hasn't come up i was hoping this summer to be able to kind of poke around at libraries up in colas county and Berlin and other areas and just sort of see if I could find a copy of the book and actually search it myself because it's one thing to use an online search engine there may be imperfections in, in, the, in the data and everything so once you get a hard copy that's one way you can look through it but obviously COVID had a different plan for the summer which is okay we'll get to it eventually hoping to put together a collection of uh, Bigfoot stories from New Hampshire and put into a book or some sort of a literary work that would uh, detail all these really interesting stories at least I think they're interesting Hopefully you guys do if you're here. So there's actually 603 Brewing. They, they make some great beer, by the way. They have a Wood Devil double IPA. And it's pretty interesting. It says, you know, the Hampshire Wood Devils are similar to Bigfoot, but they rely on their thin stature to hide among trees. Sharp teeth leave their mark. So I have not been able to find this one. I think it's a seasonal brew. Um, but if anyone is able to locate some of this, let me know. I'd love to try and just keep the can as kind of a, put in the collection there. But as you can see, they kind of have it more of a- Is that 9% alcohol? Right on. Oh, yeah. That's, that's <laughs> nine, that's nine point two. I heard it's a little bit of a darker one, but you know, we'll, we'll have, to be, have to be a judge. Uh, who was the author of the History of Coas County? Um, I'm not sure. It's one of those books that a lot, you know, a lot of these old, you, maybe you. Yeah. Well, uh, we have a book called History of Coas County, 1888, up in the New Hampshire room. So. Well, that, that's probably the same book. Oftentimes, if we go into any town, especially all these little towns in New England, doesn't matter the state, you can find a local uh, history book about what's happened in that town. They do the same thing for the counties. I don't know who authored them. I mean, I'm sure there are people that were maybe commissioned to do it at the time. So I'd be very interested in checking that out. Yeah, so we'll double. Now, this is probably one of my favorite New Hampshire big stories. I grew up not too far from there, but you guys, anyone know where Hollis, New Hampshire is? Mm -hmm. Small town in southern New Hampshire, right on the Massachusetts border. So this is an interesting one called the Hollis Flea Monster of 1977. Now it's an inter very interesting story. Uh, I'll just show you this here. This is a newspaper clipping from the National Telegraph, which describes an event that happened there. Lowell man flees Hollis after sighting monster. Police are waiting to return the Lowell, Massachusetts man after he left his trailer actually at the Hollis flea market. So what happened was it was 1977. A lot of weird stuff going on across the country. You had uh, Sandra Mancy champ photo. Had other the Whitehall, New York Bigfoot incident involving various police officers, different stories. So it's kind of a weird time, a lot of stuff going on. But uh, in Hollis, little old Hollis, New Hampshire, which is a little bit more built up now than it was then, but it's still all woods. And you can get from Hollis to Townsend or whatever in Massachusetts just by going through the woods. All these little towns are connected by big plots of trees and woods, and that's how all these other animals move through. Well, there was, uh, depending on who you talk to, there's two or three different sightings of this blondish, uh, colored, hairy creature that was around eight feet tall. A woman allegedly had her trailer shooken by one of these creatures. 
Another uh, woman claimed to have seen it behind a rock wall as it ducked down. And then the most interesting one was the flea market setting where a gentleman was uh, there and he was there with his sons and they were getting ready on it was a Saturday night. They were just camping out at the flea, flea market waiting for the next day, I'm presuming to sell things at the flea market. And they said that at one point they started feeling shaped, their trailer shape was being shown. So then there's two different versions of the story, but they both kind of come to the same conclusion. One was the gentleman then stepped out, his sons were fearful. He stepped out with a flashlight and something, one version, something brushed his shoulder. He came face to face with this hairy man-like creature that smelled like rotting fish. In the other version, he was shining his light and shined light on it and it stuck his tongue out at him, but he could see it was a hairy creature that smelled sort of like rotting fish. Really weird kind of story. Well, he got so scared that he left the trailer there, got his family and just hightailed it out of there. He was originally from Lowell, Mass. Stopped by the police station, told them about the report, and that was it. And they just kind of took off. And that that that's it. That there were no more sightings in that area. And just a very interesting story. People nicknamed it the Hollis Flea Mo or the Flea Monster. We still talk about it to this day, but I think it's a very unique story. But that's not where the story ends. This guy named Carlton Kuhn, who is an anthropologist uh, from Harvard. Some of his works have been deemed controversial today, but at the time he was considered to be you know, a respectable academic. Uh, lots of anthropology work around the world, and somehow he ended up finding an interest in Bigfoot. I don't know how. I'm still trying to track that down, try to work with Harvard, maybe see if I can you know, see, find out you know, what he was working on. But he ended up actually investigating this Hollis sighting. So this is a quote from him. Carlton Kuhn says, a year ago as a representative of the Peabody Museum of Harvard, I was sent to a town in New Hampshire, just over the Massachusetts border to investigate a site. I went there twice. The terrain was a deep map of fallen white pine needles. Several weeks after the encounter, the prints of what had been going on were still depressed an inch and a half to two inches below the surface of the needles. Fully clothed, I weigh about 168 to 170 pounds and wear a size 12 shoe. My steppings and crawlings left no marks at all. Now he interviewed this guy, Mr. St. Louis, and his sons and did a polygraph. At the time, the polygraph was considered to be very reliable. I know now it's not acceptable in court of law anymore, but and this is in the 70s, so we're talking a long time ago. They did a polygraph and passed, and he said, you know, he believed that they truly believed what they had seen. I mean, it scared them enough that they left. And the local police chief and all this suggested it was just a bear, or that sort of stuff, but Again, there was those three, two or three reports that claimed that it was a blondish, hairy man-like creature, and then there, maybe it was just passing through because there were no other sightings after that. Maybe somebody playing a prank. I don't know, but it's just an interesting story, and I think it's one of my favorites. This is actually from the Grand State um, Bigfoot comic book. So Bigfoot visits the flea market. That's what uh, we kind of come up with. But it's just a unique story, one of my favorites. It happened so long ago, but nobody really knows much else about it. And this is uh, probably one, probably my favorite, actually, New Hampshire story. I don't know, they're all up there, but this one is in the Ossipee Mountains. So you guys are, you're very close to the Ossipees. And this is a geographic map. As you can see, the Ossipee Range, just south of the Whites here, the White Mountains, is sort of circular, really weird looking. Maybe you guys have heard the term Ossipee Triangle thrown around. People say there's weird stuff that go on. Supposedly, Alistair Crowley was up here worshiping at one point when he was in the US famous occultist, UFO sightings, Bigfoot story, that kind of stuff. Well, this uh, encounter, really interesting. This guy in 1979, he was um, actually up in this area called Bald Mountain. So this is up by Connor Pond. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of this area. Uh, this is, it's, it, there's a very bad road to get up there. If you do like you know, something with four-wheel drive, all-wheel drive to get up there. This was up in, this was a few years ago, but up there. One of these mountains is Bald Mountain. I don't know which one. There aren't really any official trails to get up there. It's sort of bushwhacking. But a gentleman uh, was up there with his girlfriend at the time and their dog, and they were doing some mineral collecting, looking for rocks, and he was into that kind of thing. And they claimed that they were walking up on the mountain. They came across a ledge, and they saw a structure of stacked stone rocks with a thatched hemlock sort of roof. They were kind of confused. Inside, they said that there was a large, hairy creature sitting there with the back turned towards them. Now, I had a chance to interview this guy about three years ago now for about an hour. I mean, he was an old timer. The guy said, you know, I, there, there's not a day that goes by I don't think about this thing. Well, they looked at this. So this is just a depiction from Grand State, big for a comic book of, you know, maybe what this will look like. He said they, they were just observing this thing. 
their dog started to growl once it noticed it. Well, this thing then let out some sort of a guttural noise. He said it was a very disturbing noise that sent them running the other way. They, they could feel it. They just, they, they didn't want to be there. Whatever it was, they just were not comfortable. Halfway down the mountain, he realized they had a camera, but they could not get the courage to go back up there. Well, allegedly his girlfriend found a story then some weeks after that in the Wolfboro Library of a, a history book from that area saying that in the 1800s, there was a gentleman living on Connor Pond. I saw a dog fall through the ice, a tall, hairy man come out of the woods, pull the dog out, save its life, and then disappear in the woods. I have not been able to track that story down either. I have a friend of mine whose wife actually works at the library here in Wolfboro. I know they're doing some renovations now. I don't know if they've moved their location yet, but i um, trying to find out if that story might be true. Uh, but either way, that's that when I was up there at Connor Pond, you can see there's, there was a deer that had the misfortune of getting stuck in the ice and wasn't rescued by a tall and hairy thing, so it was picked off, and that was all you could, that was all that was left of the deer. Obviously, coyotes and other opportunists got it. But it was a really interesting story, and it was interesting talking to the gentleman. He was from just over the main border, and he said, I, I still don't know what it was, but it was very weird, and there's not a day I don't think about this particular sighting. So just an interesting story. Was it? I don't know. And he did go back a year later. He said it took him that long to get back up to this particular spot. He went to the exact spot where this structure was and there was nothing. I think it's interesting because you hear talk about structures and sticks and things being used by, supposedly being used by Bigfoot, even though there haven't really been sightings of Bigfoot creating this or, or what, what purpose structure or bent over trees and that kind of stuff would involve in. Maybe this thing was you know, using this structure or built it. I don't know. Maybe it was uh, some sort of a man, a wild, a true wild man living out there. I don't know, but it's just one of these interesting stories. And I, I'm just glad I had the chance to speak with the man. Um, I'm not sure if he's still alive anymore. He was definitely up there in age, but um, it was an interesting story though, nonetheless. So this is an artistic depiction of Bigfoot or Shy Man, as uh, Michael, who we'll see in the documentary, uh, talked about. Um, and uh, this is just a little bit when I was filming this back in 2016, I came in contact with this guy in Berlin, New Hampshire, who claimed to be a Bigfoot researcher, and I went out there and filmed with him, and we would see weird stuff like this out in the woods that you'd see it one day and then be gone the next day, or a pretty remote area, you know, where there's bear and other animal, lots of, you know, structures, since we're talking about structures, that sort of stuff. I'm not saying that's Bigfoot or anything weird. There are, of course, lots of examples of when Trees, especially in New England, with snow load, will bend over and kind of look weird. But there's some like this that's de deliberate placement that you, know, you have um, birch trees that are not, you can't find the stump anywhere. And it's just sort of placed in a deliberate, I mean, this almost looks like two sort of things. Now that could be, humans can do this, certainly. A bears can. So that's that's where it gets sort of interesting. There's just a close-up of that one there. Where you can see there's the birch tree. Um, you know, a lot of Bigfoot researchers claim that that is Bigfoot activity. I mean, I don't know. I, like I said, I've never heard of anybody really seeing one of these things building this kind of structure. So I don't know if there's religions, but I've seen some weird stuff. Even in Arizona now, when I was out there, we found, uh, we were out there with these Bigfoot researchers and they said, oh, here's some structures. And there's definitely some stuff that looked deliberately placed. But again, you can't say if that's not human. We would, again, this is another kind of thing we would find. Perfect sort of shapes can happen naturally, of course breaks going in different directions, so if it was wind or uh, that sort of natural sort of thing, maybe it would be in the same direction or uh, this kind of stuff, or twists. I mean, bears can do this. Bears will climb up into saplings and then they'll fall over, especially the younger bears, and they're, they're too heavy for a sapling and they'll bend it. But some folks claim, oh, you know, there's, it's like a pressure twist. It's like somebody really strong. It's if you just took it and twisted it. This was a hair sample that we found up there. Uh, very weird coloring. I think it's probably bare, but I haven't gotten it tested as we talked about. The testing thing is very, very uh, tricky. So if you know anyone who's got a, a state-of-the-art forensics lab, let me know. <laughs> uh, this is just a print we found out there. Nothing specific. New England is very hard to get any kind of good tracks of anything because we have all that leaf litter and everything. The winter is the best time we have for any kind of tracks. So there's really nothing conclusive I can say about this. I'll talk about this one briefly. This is possible trail camera photo taken 2013 up in Coas County. Loggers claim that they put these up and capture this weird looking thing. I don't know if it's 
uh, real or not, but I did a little investigating. I thought maybe possible hoax. This is a little bit of a better view of that um, that photo. So they're saying you know, maybe this would be the eyes up here and the, the teeth and the head and the body. I don't know. That's a little bit of close up, kind of creepy looking. Huh? Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, it is possible hoax. This kind of stuff. And the more I looked at, it, I'm like, this kind of looks familiar. Maybe it looks a little bit like this costume. This guy has the teeth out. I don't know. Let's see if we pop them together. It's, it's possible to emulate eye shine. Eye shine is something that a lot of animals produce. It's just the sort of bioluminescence of the eyes where, you know, because they're, unlike us, they see a lot better in, in the woods at night because that little light that they get reflects out. So when you shine a flashlight, that's why they get the glowing eyes. If you find deer to shine a flashlight, you'll see the eyes coming right back at you. A lot of species are like that, actually. But I don't know. Okay, this is a interesting photo, but that's always a chalk it up to. Can't do any investigating. Nobody is answering any calls. Nobody knows anything else that happened. So that's all we can really conclude. This was a photo sent to me this past fall by a friend. He claimed that somebody in his area in Mount Vernon, Southern New Hampshire, had found a strange print in their yard. Now, I really wish that there was some sort of uh, object for scale. Now, that's something, if you guys ever find a weird print out there, even if it's a big moose print, small moose print, whatever, a good thing to always carry on you is a dollar bill. If you don't have a ruler or a tape measure, a dollar bill, we all know how you know, the dimensions of the dollar bill, you could just slap the dollar, dollar, uh, dollar bill right next to that footprint, and we'll be able to tell. Because right now, I don't know how big this is. I mean, this, this grass could be uh, longer, it could be shorter, this thing could be four inches long. I, it's very hard to tell. You, and the photo is just not going to give you that sort of depth. So it's actually a really cool app. You can get it as a 3D scan where you go over an object and you you move the camera around and it creates a 3D scan. So you have that data to work with. That's another thing, but the dollar bill is probably a little bit easier. <laughs> Briefly, we'll talk about the Sunapi region possible class B. Now this is, I don't really do much like field investigating. I'm not really into that. I'm more on the documentary filming side and trying to get to the bottom of some of these older stories. But every once in a while, if I have a friend who's claimed to have had activity, they'll go out, you know, they'll hit me up. And this was one of them in 2019 where a friend of mine was out there um, in the Sunapee region where he lives, going out to hang out with his family one night, just went out to the, the shed to grab some wood. And what he would do is he would take the sticks to kind of dust them off and hit them together and then put them in his little cart, as you can see here, and wheel them back to the house. Well, one night he did that, and, he, and as soon as he did that, it was dark, something responded back. And he was like, oh, that's kind of weird. He wasn't even thinking Bigfoot. Um, he's like, that's, that's well, some other suckers out here doing the same thing like me, you know, collecting wood for the wood stove inside. Well, he said the next few nights, he did the same thing and he got another sort of response back. At that point, he's like, okay, this is kind of interesting. I've, uh, he's not really a researcher, he's just into it peripherally. Uh, he's, a, he's a history professor. Um, so, yeah, the same kind of thing happened. And then a couple of nights in a row, and he's like, okay, this is interesting. You know, I live in a rural area, who's doing this? You know, my neighbor, I don't see any neighbors or anything like that. And there's a huge swath of wilderness right near his, his home. And then the uh, final time he had what was, what he described as at first sounded like an air raid siren, just going, Aah. he said that he's a huge history buff, really into World War II stuff. He said, it sounded like a World War II siren. And then it kind of sounded like a lot of the Bigfoot audio we've heard on a lot of these programs and you know, podcasts, that kind of stuff. And he said, it was interesting, it kept going and you could hear it from the woods, and then it just kind of settled down. And right as his family started pulling in the driveway, he was trying to get his phone out. And then, unfortunately, but he couldn't hear the sound over his daughters and everything going on. But it's an interesting one. And when we went out there, or well, actually, this is his, um, he has a little area there across the street from him where he found these prints kind of leading up to a tree that perfectly is an outlook on their house there. Unfortunately, they were very deteriorated, but at least he took a business card it right there so that's something as well that you can kind of determine the, the dimensions of something but we went out there and just kind of poked around and flew my drone over the area you can see power line area a lot of wildlife use the power line to traverse it's easier i mean just because the moose and, and bear live out in the woods they see a human path hey that's a path of least resistance i'm going to use that instead of having to go through this tough grass or go through an area that maybe a predator might come after me so power lines lots of animals use it to traverse so, and there's been a lot of uh, Bigfoot sightings that happen near and around power lines. I've actually had some stuff happen in southern New Hampshire near a power line area. These are just some of the photos from that spot. It's a beautiful area. And I think that's actually not pure, sorry, I'm not sure. 
This is a humorous story. I, I got to share this one. Bigfoot break-ins from the Conway Daily Sun, August 2019. This was an article. <laughs> Did anybody see this at the time? <laughs> but it's funny. It's, it's, it's not what you'd expect. So I'll just read a little bit from it. So this is a satirical letter, letter to the editor. We know about these supposed bear break-ins across the northern parts of the valley. Cars and houses getting broken into and stolen from apparent bears. But after extensive research, I'm confident these break-ins are actually the presence of Sasquatch being covered up by fish and game. But why would I think this? You see, when the first bear broke into Spruce Mountain, they set up traps to catch it and caught it the next day. But soon after, another break-in was reported at Spruce. There's no way two bears thought to do the exact same thing two times in a row. The trap was just a decoy so the public would not notice. Sasquatch are very smart creatures. They would not fall into a trap. Although some may not realize Sasquatch are native to this area, a forest similar to the Pacific Northwest, the Northeast creates excellent habitat for Bigfoot. After much human intervention, supplies are becoming scarce and Bigfoot is resorting to invading homes and vehicles. I still can't understand why people think bears could so easily open the car doors. They don't have opposable thumbs. The Sasquatch, on the other hand, does, allowing him to open doors like humans. <laughs> so that's, this guy was obviously, there was a lot of these break-ins going on and it was just a funny letter. It wasn't serious. Maybe there's some truth to some of the stuff about that, that's similar to the Pacific Northwest and that kind of thing, but all jokes aside, that was, just a little, little lighthearted sort of funny article I remember coming across then online. I'm like, wow, this is, this is great. Again, it just shows how much Bigfoot is culturally in people's heads in a lot of these areas. But this is a little bit of a, like I said, I'm not really a researcher. There's an area that I know of where there's some potential activity and I've heard weird things. I've had things throwing stuff around my campsite and walking around and knocking on trees all night as we're trying to sleep. And since the COVID started, I would go out to this area almost daily and I was having wood knocks and I met actually a property owner in the area who has been living there for almost 40 years, says, you know, he's had Bigfoot on his property and all sorts of activity right near this area. It's a very rural area of the south, uh, you know, in southern New Hampshire. So it's just kind of interesting. Uh, I'm making no claims, but I do have some audio of some of the stuff on my YouTube channel, Sasquatch Out of the Shadows, so if anyone wants to check that out at any point. Just kind of interesting. I don't know. Like I said, I, I can't say conclusively what it is one way or another, but hey, I like being out in the woods, so any excuse to get out there and find any big or other things. Um, yeah. <laughs> Just a quick plug for my uh, one of my favorite local research groups. There aren't very many, like aside from the BFR stuff, there aren't many local New England groups. One of the best is Team Squatchachusetts. I just think they have the coolest <laughs> name and logo and everything. And, my buddy John Wilk and Dave McCullough, and they do some fantastic research. There's actually a lot of sightings in Massachusetts, especially Western Mass, which is the Berkshires. They got a lot of trees. Not that you know, everyone's living in the eastern part with Boston. You also have the Bridgewater Triangle down south of Boston. A lot of strange paranormal stories from that area. So they've collected a lot of sightings from across the state. As you can see, pretty much everywhere where Boston isn't, which is this whole area, you have sightings going on, even a couple close to the Cape. Maybe Bigfoot went out to see some great whites, great sharks out there or something. I don't know. Great place you can go check out is the International Cryptozoology Museum in Portland, Maine. This is Lauren Coleman. He's uh, one of the world's most renowned cryptozoologists. Dozens of books, TV shows he's been investigating since the 60s, 70s. A really cool museum. They just opened up a couple months ago now after months of closure, of course, because of COVID. So if you're ever in Portland and you're into this kind of stuff, it's a perfect place to check out. Uh, there's like a brew yard right next door, and they got some great food and beer. So it's kind of a fun stop, especially if you're up in the area. This is myself with some of the exhibits. You know, they have a full size Bigfoot and lots of like souvenirs and stuff from all over the world with all kinds of cryptids, not just Bigfoot and lake monsters, but there's some champ stuff. I don't know why I have this here. But yeah, the Grand State Bigfoot comic book. I feel like I had so many slides with that in there. But um, yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Thank you for. for listen to me ramble on about this kind of stuff for a while. <laughs> Hopefully learn something new, and if not, um, you know, at least uh, you know a little bit about Bigfoot in New Hampshire now. So. All right. With that said, we will uh, now show the documentary, and then we'll do a little bit of Q&A. We good on time? It's 7.30, but we are good, too. OK. Yeah, you're good. I think I went on a little bit longer. Yeah, it's OK. All right, so I did have someone ask. Um, if you would be okay with maybe posting the slides 
somewhere that they could see them because it didn't really quite show up. Okay. Time. Yeah, yeah. We can talk about it. Okay. Absolutely. Maybe I can put it on a drive or a Google Drive or something. But yeah, so I'll show this and then we can do some QA and stuff like that. My name is Michael Eastman. Uh, I live in Berlin, New Hampshire. I'm retired now, was a artist, uh, painter, and owned a business here in town for many years, about 21 years. And then prior to that, I was in the military for four years. And, uh, this is my hometown where I live. Many years ago, I went back to uh, the people, uh, Abenaki. As far as how I live my life today, a lot of it is founded on those very uh, basic principles. And of course, for the purposes of this topic, um, I approach it from that angle, uh, more of a cultural angle than anything else. Rather than call them Sasquatch for the sake of retaining our language, I refer to them as shiny and Satipapa. I saw the, the very first one I saw up at the lake, uh, up at Omegog, uh, a woman got um, back in 1973, and I was sleeping out on the porch. Um, it uh, came walking through the woods. I could hear it, and, and as I laid there listening, I had taken off my glasses and put them on the uh, sofa that I was sleeping on, and so they were above my head. I could hear it snapping off, spruce, spruce tines and that kind of thing. But then it got really quiet, and as I laid there, and I wasn't really concerned about anything, and as I laid there, I was by, by myself. Um, as I laid there, I smelled something, and it, it was a very heavy, heavy, heavy odor. Uh, reminded me very similar to a monkey house kind of smell with almost a diesel, uh, very unpleasant. And and then I heard a sound on the screen, and I looked over. I hadn't put my glasses on. I was expecting to see maybe a big moth or something like that. And uh, as I looked over, there was just this massive, massive being standing there staring at me. It was huge. And it was the first time in my life, and I've done a lot of really crazy stuff in my lifetime. And it was the one time in my life where I literally hyperventilated. Uh, I couldn't catch my breath. I couldn't speak, and I literally could not move. I just laid there hyperventilating. It walked to the side of the camp where the door was. It pressed on it, and uh, but it left and walked down to the lake. And it walked into the water. I sat up. I put my glasses on, and I just sat there on the couch looking at this thing. And it went over to the motor boat and played around with the motor a little, and uh, then walked off into the uh, this area that like a wetland and uh, went into there. Um, so that was my, uh, that was my first experience and, and actually the most terrifying. Then this past, uh, in 2015, I saw a number of them. 
I, uh, I decided to go out and do some research on uh, Cheyenne. And in large part, uh, the foundation of the research was that I wanted to prove that they're there so that in fact, um, because I think they deserve the same, uh, uh, the same treatment as any other rare species that may be running about in a forest. So um, I went into the research with the hopes of getting legislation passed to protect them both from hunting and trapping. And uh, so I went to an area where I knew that there was a family group of them. I found their area several years ago. I wound up calling it Wola Dock so that I would not give away the location in discussing it with anyone. And uh, I went in and spent, uh, spent the next nine months going in roughly almost every day to observe and, and research and collect as much information as I possibly could. This is the track that, uh, that I poured out there. It's of a, uh, of a younger one, but you can see the instep here. This is a left foot and you can see the instep, the big toe, uh, and then the other two digits. Uh, you can't see them only because it was on, a, on an incline and it stepped on the instep. This is the hair that I took off from a tree. Uh, it was roughly about seven feet up. And uh, while I never saw any porcupine activity in that area, uh, I, can't, I can't totally negate it either. So until such time as I can get it tested, uh, I'll just have to assume that it is porcupine here, but it came from right, right there where they were, uh, where I was doing my research. Now, when you look at this, when you look at this one here, uh, if you look very closely, you can see that there are teeth marks on it. Uh, to look on the back, they appear to be relatively flat. This is my fake rock that I built to put a camera in and I put a lens on it to make it look like, or make it look like there was a lens. What I had done was I would go out to Woolagock and I would pull this apart because I wanted them to see me messing with it all the time so that when I actually put in a camera, I was hoping that they wouldn't, uh, you know, they wouldn't be bothered by it. And you can see where they tried to pull this apart and realizing they got this pin pulled out, uh, but they also peeled at it, trying to open it. And then they knew that something had to be done on this side. This is, uh, this is the equipment that I've been using. Uh, it's just a little audio recorder. Um, it's really, really basic, which I like because you can't manipulate it. But what I would do is I would take this, turn it on, slide it, into a sleeve uh, and I could either pull these out and stick it in a rock or I could tack it to a tree and just hope that I remember where I stuck it. All right, so this first sound is uh, Shy Man's traditional language, it's a click pop language and uh, here you go. This next sound is like a, a bellowing kind of sound. It has somewhat of a metallic nature to it. I don't know, again, I don't know why, uh, but this is what goes on out there at night. that isn't quite so friendly.
when I went into this, I, I wanted to approach them because I felt if I approached them in a way that was reminiscent of how we used to act 600 years ago, I thought, well, I'll go in and I'll speak to them in Abenaki, but beyond that, I couldn't help but wonder what they, whether they would respond to that or not. So what I did was, you know, back a long time ago, when we went into somebody else's area, we would bring tribute and we would leave that for, for or you know, gift it to the individual who controlled that particular piece of turf. So I entered that area that way and uh, they responded, they're not the animal, if I can put it that way, that I thought they were. They personally, to me, after having spent a fair amount of time around them and them around me, um, in some instances, 30 feet away maybe, they stayed behind glacial erratics and, uh, and blowdowns and things like that. But I could hear them quick popping, talking to one another in their own language. They are very family orientated. They have family groups. I believe that they possibly have clans um, that communicate with each other, seeing where it is that they live, what the terrain is, and what features, uh, stick structures, all these other things, breaks, bends. I found that some of the things that they make are very similar to what our people did culturally. And so I find that there's almost this indigenous tribal kind of thing going on. And, and I have not proven this yet, but I hope to in the years that follow. I think that everybody is getting these little tiny pieces and they're plopping them in. And through all these various means, I think that someday uh, we will discover what these beings really are, what they represent, what they reflect. Uh, but the one thing that I do know and I see expressed in the forest from time to time, you know, we're impacting them in a big way and that's why they need to be protected. It's just a matter of time. We have a thousand miles of, of ATV trails now uh, and snow machine trails, et cetera. Uh, we have windmills popping up everywhere. We have all these, all these things that we do as human beings that are impacting their environment in a very big way. And I think that this is something that I would encourage other researchers to do as well as, I'm not saying don't blow at night because if that's your gig, it's your gig, have fun. But I would also say, maybe try going out and getting out there in daylight hours so that you can see their influences in the forest around you because they do some of it is so subtle that the average person is not even going to notice but that's the other thing start if we all start becoming very aware do i think that there's the potential for for that moment where we all sit there and we go wow um, yeah, I do. I, I, I really do. Comment from you. Oh, wait, hold on. Oh, okay, I do have one <laughs> or two. Um, Catherine was wondering um, if you know about any sightings, historical or current, in Merrimack County. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know any off the top of my head right here, but according to that data, there's definitely some sightings in Merrimack County. I mean, yeah, there's plenty of woods out there too. So pretty much all these wooded areas, I mean, you can expect to have at least some sightings submitted to either the uh, you know, BFRO or other local groups, maybe even some paranormal groups might have information, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I can't think of any of them in Merrimack County, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if there were quite a few. She also was wondering if there are any hot spots for sightings in New Hampshire. Good question. Yeah, I wouldn't say there's exactly any hot spots because New Hampshire is so wooded and um, usually you need people for there to be sightings, but I would say probably in general, an area that probably has more of the sightings would be like the western part of New Hampshire. So um, south of the White Mountains, kind of towards the Connecticut River, because that is probably the most rural area that has a high number of people. I mean, there's a lot of houses out that way, as opposed to much of Cross County, where it's just woods. And there's just, you know, maybe most of the sightings will be on the outskirts of town or right near town. Um, so. Yeah, I'd probably say that part of western New Hampshire, but there aren't really any hot spots or clusters. I mean, like even the Hollis incident, that was just a random thing. There's no sustained activity in Hollis. I know my area that I go to, there seems to be stuff going on a lot. I don't usually get that out publicly, but uh, if you kind of poke around in your local community, ask people if they've had any experiences like that. Yeah, there's some folks that have stuff going on all the time I'm on the property. I remember shortly after I moved here, Probably because my backyard, my backyard, my land looks just like that land. I had huge ledge cliffs and it's right. very forested. I'm always taking pictures of the wood line because I can't see anything in there. Right, but right. it's like maybe I'll look at it. I'm sure you've got, other, you've got plenty of other critters. In you know, and bears and bobcats. I, I do have a game camera oh, and cool. a little blink camera up there. So we've caught foxes yeah. and. So my horses aren't bothered by any of that stuff. The bears Something walk right through the pasture. But I remember one night, it was probably two in the morning, and I'm not a good sleeper. I am one of those people that brought my wander around in the, <laughs> I know, in the woods at night. And my old pony had gotten out, and he was, we hadn't done any clearing of the land or anything. He was like in this thicket area. I heard the most God awful scream I've ever heard. And I actually ran back down to the house and woke my husband up. And I'm like, you have to hear this. I don't even know what it is. I mean, I heard foxes scream, right. like old like women screaming for help. That I heard sense. fisher cats. Yeah. I've never heard anything like this. And you know, Colorado, I used to hear the mountain lions behind my oh. house screeching when they were in heat. Yeah, yeah. And so he woke up and he's like, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah I was really, really kind of, I don't think I even had a barn for the pony at that time. But yeah, sometimes my horses are very agitated. They don't want to go in their barn. Um, you just get this feeling and you can look at dusk. There's almost a ledge through the woods so you can kind of see the sun setting. And I always tell myself, I am going to die if I ever see. <laughs> <laughs> An easy place to be washed from. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Yeah, thank you. I can say that we, we watch a lot of, probably any Bigfoot show that's on. Hearing that this close and, and hearing that is so amazing to me. Because <laughs> seriously, if I, heard, if I was out in the woods and I heard that, I'd be gone. Yeah. yeah. Because on TV, yeah. they're like, oh, yeah, hear this, hear this. And you cannot grasp wow. the, I mean, that's amazing. That yeah. that was crazy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and some people have said, oh, well, what about those sounds? They could have been, you know, a woodpecker. And yeah, that's possible. Could have been uh, other animals as well. Sure. I mean, certainly. But some of the weird, I mean, when, I, when he first played those bird noises for me, too, like in the same room, it like pierced your ears how yeah. loud it was. And it, it's like the bird was literally on top of the audio recorder because there's the audio recorders at a peak, you know. And if that was at night, I've never heard anything like that at night. Oh. I mean, they we're big debunkers. We really are. Yeah. You know, my daughter was hearing noises up there and her boyfriend was scared. So we were up there the, <laughs> the other night and she's like, did you hear that? And I'm listening. I'm like, it's a frog. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> frogs make funny. All yeah. kinds of noises. Yeah. It's important to know the other sounds of the other animals yeah. out there because there can be some weird noises. Mountain lions make very weird noises. Yeah, they do. 
the vixen scream of the fox. Went, that's Fisher. terrifying. Fisher, Fisher cats. Yeah, we had one on my roof in a, yeah. I was in college in Connecticut, and my roommates were like, "Oh my God, there's somebody being raped outside." Yeah. And we're all, I'm like, "No, no, it's like an animal. It's right above us. It's wow. we're in the woods." And yeah. it was, it, yeah, they're. But once you get that, and like you talk to people who are you know, lifelong outdoorsmen, they've been hunting all their lives. They've heard all the other stuff, and they have something going on. That's what's really interesting. Or you know, folks like yourself that are. You know what the other things sound like, so it can be kind of interesting to talk to people like that. We're gonna have to pay more attention though to the structures because even today we were like, was that like that yesterday? <laughs> you know, we walk our dogs up in the woods every day. Right, right. Because where we go, there are no people. So yeah. interesting. Yeah, yeah. And yeah we're, definitely. We have it in the back of our minds. You know, we're not the kind of people like that's big it has to or be that's good. ghost yeah. or that. You know what I mean? So, Absolutely. but it's always kind of back there. You just. You, you get that feeling that you're being watched. I mean, that's always instinctual. To, in yeah. Washington, I did a lot. I used to pick mushrooms and I'd be in there all weekend picking from Friday night till Sunday afternoon. And I almost always felt it was either a mountain lion or oh, yeah. something was watching. You get that tingling no. feeling. I, I had it happen this past April. I took a friend of mine into this area hiking at night. He had never been in there. I didn't tell him any stories of anything that happened there previously. And we both were coming out of this wooded trail. And we had this, I, I, this is the only time I've ever felt this, where it happened this weirdly. I had this feeling, I've had the feeling of being watched before, but I'm thinking in my head, man, we're being watched. And at that same exact moment, my friend blurts out, I think we're being watched. I mean, I couldn't explain the fact that I'm thinking that he said that. I turned him like, what? How did you know that I was thinking this? He's like, I don't know, man. I just... I'm feeling all weird. Yeah. Oh. About five minutes after that, we heard something break a tree not far. It was knocking for about 10 minutes, banging trees. And I got that on audio recording. But you know, it's like you, you get those instincts, don't don't uh, disregard them because we have a lot of that ingrained in us from our ancestors that were hunted by all sorts of things. So mm -hmm. a big cat is in the area, and you start getting tingling or something we else. We used to fish for steelhead oh, in yeah. uh, the Wainuchi River and the Satsup River and all of those right at the bottom of the Olympics. Oh. And it was fishing, it was like that. You'd be fishing and you'd have a bunch of fish on the shore and you'd think, oh, somebody, somebody's <laughs> trying to get my fish, I think. <laughs> and Washington has, uh, I think, the, boat, the most uh, Bigfoot sightings in the country. And that is a the thick boat. rainforest. Yeah, you get in there. It's, it's like New Hampshire, but 10 times bigger. Yeah. We have plenty of space here, but out there it's like a different, different ballgame, let alone British Columbia or Alaska, which mm -hmm. are bigger areas. So. Amazing. Anything else from the Zoom? So on your list, your um, things that you researched, we didn't notice any puck wedgies. Have you ever heard that legend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, that's an interesting one. That's you know, kind of uh, Native American folklore, the Wampanoags down in the Bridgewater Triangle area. It's funny actually. I was mentioning I was in Arizona. That's for this uh, series I'm the executive producer on with a friend of mine from Wisconsin or uh, Minnesota rather, and uh, we filmed it. the first season. We're investing four different cryptids. We just filmed Mogollon Monster in Arizona. That's a Bigfoot-like creature. But in March, literally three days before Massachusetts declared a COVID state of emergency, they flew out here and we filmed a thing on the puck budgie. So we were down in the Freetown State Forest in that area. Man, that's a creepy area. Yeah. A lot of yeah. My um, father has a friend and he's this big logger kid. He spends a lot of time in the wood logging. And up near where they go walk their dogs every night, he swears on his life that this little man ran after him and was stabbing him in the calves. Wow. And he is, was legit terrified. Will not go back to that area ever. And that was in New Hampshire? Or? Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. I've heard of the stories, yeah, in other parts of the, but Massachusetts, like the Bridgewater of China, seems to be like the yeah. epicenter. But I don't know if it's real or not. I mean, it's one of these things that I lean more towards it being more folklore. Mm -hmm. When I was down there, it seemed like there's just satanic rituals and, and mass murder there in the Freetown State Forest. And Pukwudgie is kind of just like a story among all these other twisted stories. Yeah, my husband actually worked with another guy, and he, I think he was from up north. He swears that he ran into them too. <laughs> I've heard some people up in Maine that have claimed to have had little people on their property, strange mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I don't know who's to say. I mean, there's so many weird things out there in the world. Um, yeah. Yeah, Bigfoot being you know, just one of them. There's plenty of other strange things. And, you know, I don't really do much of the ghost stuff. I'm not really into it. I just prefer being out in the woods or out in the wilderness. But I have had a couple of UFO type encounters, just seeing things in the sky. And just very Me too. 
can't explain. I mean, I'm 13. sure lots of people have. But. I was 13, I saw a UFO. It was a star one second, and then it was all the light around me the next second. Wow. And then it was a star again. Yeah. And me and another guy. And when I was 16, that was my friend and I's big goal. We would drive around all night out by Rocky Flats, east of Boulder. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's we like my we would go down to Cheyenne Mountain. I love that area. My friend is his apartment is right there. Oh, is it? Right in Rocky Flats, the nature area. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. It's far for sunset. But. That was really built up, but yeah. there was nothing out there when I was in school. Wildlife refuge, yeah. Yeah, there's there's lots of stuff like that. And New Hampshire obviously has a big history of UFO sightings as well. Betty and Barney Hill, abduction mm -hmm. and Exeter incident on the seacoast. That's right around the 70s when we were kids. We'd all go yeah. every night. The whole neighborhood was from Tilton. Yeah. And we'd all go right up in the Crip School field and have binoculars and telescopes. And we'd all mm -hmm. swear you saw stuff flying around. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We saw it. The one I saw in Pennsylvania was 2019. We were out there doing case and some big for research and that kind of stuff and we saw this thing that it was like it looked like a, a cloud with a light inside of it that was just slow motion through the air and then a small bright light flew out of it at high speed and went into it and it happened a couple times we got on a video and we're all just like it's just nuts i mean what yeah yeah and it kind of gets you know stuff but are they primarily nocturnal is that you remember watching shows are always like around the dark at night. yeah it seems like a, most of the, a lot of the we talked about point earlier in the day to see what they've done i guess from the night you know, yeah i mean I, it's tough to say and yeah, that yeah. bothers me sometimes i watch those like finding bigfoot and stuff that a lot of the people they talk to yeah i was we were down there fishing during the day or we were hiking yeah. during the yeah. day we started thinking, yeah. okay it's nighttime time to do our investigation yeah. 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 Well, the idea is, I guess, that you know, if these things are out there, they're probably more nocturnal. Like other animals, they're kind of hunkered down during the day and they feed at night. Yeah. Um, and it tends to be more activity, I guess, at night. And, and I think the more people, the more we, yeah. tend, we tend to be. Oh, and, and cautious. I mean, as I said, the majority of the sightings tend to be people just seeing it kind of get away from them, fleeing or trying to get out of the area. They get a fleeting glimpse, just like if you think you saw a moose or something else. A lot of the times they're just running away, they're trying to get away. Yeah. So it's hard to even get a picture, you know, let's say. You see a moose in the corner of your eye over there. Oh, get my phone. By the time you get it out, it's already gone. I've had to have everybody having a like, recording device in their pockets nowadays. Yeah, or the end of drone. Something's going to be, something you take the chance to get very brave. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. I, but I think at the same time, less and less people compared to 200 years ago are out in the woods. You know, a lot of people moving towards urban areas. Yeah. Sure, there's plenty of people camping, but how many people really go way off the trail? Right. They're watching the woods like this, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. On their phone. Yeah. I tell you, I mean, I, I got this uh, friend of mine borrowed me this floor unit. It's a oh, I like that one. Yeah, he's, I've, he's, I've seen. Uh, I saw one time a buck in the woods right there. Beautiful antlers, mm -hmm. just right. Uh, elk, I saw them in Arizona. Now you could see a mouse running past you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we had one night. It was uh, Fourth of July. Actually, we did some fireworks in our area. And, and then we had stuff moving around the campsite. I'm with the floor and I can't see three feet in the woods, but there's something knocking and breaking sticks and I can't even see it. I'm like, where is this thing? Yeah. That's just how thick the woods can get. So yeah. even with all that technology, it's surprising how, unless you're really out there, how little yeah. um, progress I guess you can make. There's a lot of activity at night. Take your headlamp and shine it across mm. the grassy area. You will see all thousands of, of eye shines. Yeah. Spiders. <laughs> all sorts of yeah. stuff. Yeah. Right there. Bro, yeah. Bro. <laughs> This is great. We have to get you get all the way Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You guys want to take a chance and just look at um sure. look at some of the tracks and that kind of stuff. It's yeah. a little bit of a display, but thank you guys so much for thank you for coming. Uh, yes, yeah, thank, thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's nice to do an in-person presentation finally. Yes, it's yes. been a while to do an online stuff, but mm -hmm. yeah, we were happy if you could actually come. Yeah, who's watched every show, right? Uh, right down awesome. Even the mountain monsters. It's funny though, it's you know, they get yeah. to eat off the exactly. yeah. monster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, have a good night. I did have a question night. about right, um, Michael Leakman. Sure. Because you did your video in 2016. Is he still researching? Yeah, to some extent. I know it's, he's uh, he has some injuries. He used to be in the army and get a lot of like injuries from that kind of stuff. Oh, okay. Um, but he I haven't talked to him probably when the whole coronavirus thing started. Yeah. Yeah, he's still trying to get out there every once in a while into the woods. So I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't tell anybody. Yeah, I mean, yeah. About that today. Yeah. We're like, what? he doesn't really I talk about it much anymore really because people, yeah. harass them. Yeah. people judge and people, you know, they don't yeah. understand. I don't care. I don't think about me. Yeah. 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 Ye
I made I made cracks when I lived in Washington. Yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. It's yeah, not I strapped them right on. I strapped them right on. Every time I go fishing at the river or the ocean, or I stomp in the sand. Yeah. I never saw. I stand watch, wait for people to see them, but nobody ever even noticed them. It's not that hard to make the tracks. Yeah, really. Is. No. But I think what's interesting is when you get people like Dr. Jeff Meldrum and others who footprint experts, mm -hmm. anthropologists, they see some of these really good footprints and they say, "Well, this is something that." How, how would you, you need to have my knowledge of yeah. physiology to make a track like this. And Melbourne, so, he does a lot of stuff, doesn't he? Like, yeah, he's, oh, on yeah. all, he's on all the shows. I had him on my show, the first episode of my live stream I do every Monday. Just amazing to talk to him. He knows his stuff. That's the truth. Yeah. You know, I've lived literally where they live, and I saw them twice in my life.